morning, church. It's great to be with you this morning. Trust that you are keeping nice and warm on this cold Sunday morning. If you are visiting with us for the first time, we'd love for you to go to our website and just get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. Our website is on the screen. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Uh, it's such a great opportunity to be able to get together and worship together, to be able to praise God. That is what we are here for, to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So let's do that this morning. Let us worship Him. Stand up where you are, make some noise, raise your hands. Let us worship God right now.
Yeah, Lord Jesus, we're grateful for your amazing love, your amazing grace towards us. We're so thrilled that we have one who has gone to the cross to show his love for us and his concern and his kindness and his gentleness. We just look to you and we rest in you, Lord Jesus. Yeah, Lord, it is so good to be able to come before you and just worship you, God. Thank you for your goodness towards us. Thank you for your love towards us, Father God. Thank you that you would send your son to die on the cross for us, Jesus. We are so, so, so grateful to you for that, Father. And we just want to come before you and just say we love you, Lord. We want to continue to just focus on you, put our eyes on you, and just continue to magnify you because that is what you deserve, Heavenly Father. Amen. Church, I've got some great news for us this morning. Lindsay and Eric have had their baby. 
Shepard Trussler was born and he is a bouncing baby boy. Mom and baby are doing so well and big brother Jaken is very, very chuffed with his new role. In our calendar, we have the Empowered Advanced Kids Conference uh, coming up. This conference is to empower parents and kids leaders to be disciple makers of our children. This conference will be held online over four weeks, will be one hour on a Saturday. If you are interested and would like to get some more information, please get in touch with Brett. His email will be on the screen. As a church, we love to get together and do things on Mandela Day. Unfortunately, this year we are unable to because of lockdown. But as a church, we have partnered with another church, City Life Church, to be able to put food parcels together to serve into the communities of Clay Oven and Ginger Park. However, if you are doing stuff for Mandela Day, please can you send us in some photos, some videos, we'd love to see what you are getting up to. There's been a song going around called The Blessing, a virtual choir where churches sing together. We have our own version, we've done our own one. And it's just gonna be wonderful to see us singing that blessing over each other right now. The Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you be gracious to you the lord turn his face toward you and give you
What a joy. I honestly didn't know that so many of you had such good voices. I suppose we're going to have to relook at our worship team when we start meeting again. Right now we're going over into a new series. Stephen will be preaching to us out of the book of Esther. Over to you, Stephen. Well, good morning. Uh, we are in the second part of a series uh, called Faith and Uncertainty. Uncertainty is often very difficult to deal with. Uh, we haven't been able to see our son Thomas uh, for the whole of this year. Uh, uh, but what makes that most difficult to cope with is the fact that we just don't know when we'll get to see him again. There's a degree of uncertainty. If you know that, well, uh, definitely on the 1st of April 2021 is the date, then you can cope with that and you can plan for that and you get excited about it. But the not knowing can often be what's difficult. And we're living in really uncertain times. And so what we're looking at is how does our faith affect the way that we cope with uncertainty? And we're doing that by looking at four different characters from the Bible. Ryan kicked us off last week uh, by looking at the story of Hannah. And this morning, uh, we are going to be looking at the life of Esther. Uh, let me give you a quick overview of the book of Esther, uh, just in case it's new for you. Uh, the Jews are living, uh, they've been carried off into exile into Persia. Um, and the Persian Empire is ruled by King Xerxes. Now this guy, he's a kind of crazy, drunken, powerful king. Uh, he deposed his first wife, Queen Vashti, because she stood up to his tyranny and she spoke out against it. And so he needed a new queen and Esther was selected as that queen. Now Esther's much more subservient, she's much more compliant and this pleases the king. Uh, the king's got a right-hand guy, he's the kind of prime minister if you want, his name is Haman, and Haman is a horrible, horrible individual. He loves power, he loves attention, he loves money, uh, he loves fame, he loves glory, and he wants everyone to bow down to him. So much so that they issue a decree to say that everybody should bow down uh, to Haman. And such is the power and the fear that this man generates that the entire, the entire nation does bow down except for one guy. His name is Mordecai. And Haman is so bothered by Mordecai's refusal to bow down to him. He is so incensed, he's so irritated, he's so angry that he decides uh, Mordecai needs to go. But you know what? Not just Mordecai, that entire Jewish nation needs to go. All of God's people living in Persia. And so he goes to the king Xerxes and he basically pitches this idea as a revenue stream. He's, he basically says, Let, give me permission to commit genocide against all of the Jews. I'll plunder their possessions and I'll give you th their possessions. And that will, that will equate to like a 50% increase in the tax base for the year. And all that income, King Xerxes, is for you. So the king signs the decree, the date is set, and death is on the horizon for all of God's people. And Esther finds out about this, and lo and behold, 
She is a Jew, but she's managed to hide this fact. No one knows this, not even her husband, the king himself. Now, the fact that she has kept it hidden means that she's not necessarily been a faithful, godly, amazing woman all of her life. It means she's not been obeying the scriptures. She's not been tithing. Uh, she's not been uh, uh, practicing public prayers. She's not been uh, celebrating feasts, festivals, and holidays. It means she's not been obeying the dietary laws of the Old Testament. She's not been meeting with God's people. She's not been worshiping with God's people. She won't have been studying the scriptures. She would profess a faith but she, doesn't, uh, uh, she certainly doesn't practice it. And so no one knows that she's Jewish, not even her husband. But now the death uh, sentence has been set for Mordecai. The gallows have been built um, on which he will die. And uh, Mordecai, by the providence of God, is also Esther's adoptive father. But all of God's people now have this death sentence. And so she too, is now in danger. And the date Mordecai will be hanged from the gallows and the decree allowing all of the Jews living in Persia to be killed and their possessions plundered has been set. And this is the dramatic part of the story. You can kind of feel the drama as this unfolds. Everything is culminating towards this moment. And the first question is, will all of God's people die? The decree has been set. So we pick up the story in Esther chapter 4, and Jess is going to read that to us. I will be reading from 4 Esther, verses 5 through to 17. Then Esther called for Hatak, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hatak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him, and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and command her to go to the king to beg for his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hatak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hatak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law, to be put to death, except to the one whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these thirty days. And then they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come into the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young woman will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Great, so the, so the, the story is taking place um, outside at the gate of the palace. Now, the palace was almost like a city within the city. It was home uh, not just to the king, but all to the governmental and the societal officials. It was, it was set on the highest point of the city, but it wasn't just the high point geographically, it was the pinnacle of society. If you lived at the palace, if you worked at the palace, you had made it to the top. If you practiced law, uh, if you were a lawyer and you practiced it in the palace, you were at the top of your career. If you were in finance, if you were in the arts, but you got to work at the palace, then you couldn't really go any higher than that. And the palace is where Esther finds herself. And we've got this decree that goes out to destroy the Jews. We've got a Jewish girl living in the palace as queen. And Mordecai comes to her and says, Esther, you have got to use what you have got. You have got to use your position in the palace. You've got to use your royal position, your societal and your cultural capital to bring about justice. You have to do something. 
And so my first observation this morning is that there is an importance to where God has positioned you. Throughout scripture, we see God working through people. And at times, yeah, it's through the priests, it's through the prophets, it's through the the full-time missionaries like Paul. But many other times, it's through individuals taking up their place in society, whether it be Joseph, whether it be Daniel, and in this situation, whether it be Esther. Not just people inside believing communities, not just preachers and missionaries, but everyone in society, in places of influence, in homes, in schools, in boardrooms, in restaurants. He uses them all. There is an importance to where God has positioned you. You see, when God created man, our relationship was broken in the Garden of Eden when sin entered the world. And so God wants to, and it's always about restoring our relationship with him. That is first and foremost. We preach it every week here about the importance of repentance and forgiveness and a restoring of a relationship and an intimacy with God. But it doesn't stop there. Because having won you to himself, God then commissions you to go and to bring about his kingdom on earth, to love others, to fight injustice uh, to, to where there is injustice, to bring joy uh, where there is pain, to bring life where there is death. That's what we should be about as Christ followers. Our relationship with God was broken, but so too is our relationship with one another. That's why we have racism. That's why we have war. That's why we have gender-based violence. That's why there is oppression. God has restored you to himself. But then having done that, he then positions you. He positions you in law, in medicine, in finance, in education, in the arts to bring around about his rule and reign, to love mercy, to fight injustice, to care for the poor and and the oppressed. And that's what God calls each of us who would say, I'm a follower of his to do. But you might look at me and say, well, Stephen, that's great. But I'm no Queen Esther. I'm not in a significant place of influence to bring around justice. But I'd suggest this morning that if you're in Joburg, you're in the palace. You see, people often view Johannesburg much like people viewed the palace in Persia. People come to Joburg to to feather their own nest, to develop their own careers, to use the cultural, intellectual, relational and financial capital that there is here in order to get ahead. People come to, to the city in order to further their careers so that eventually they can move back to where they came from. Because if you can make it in Joburg, you can make it anywhere. If you are successful here, well, you're going to be a king back in that small town near the coast. And you've come to the palace. And Mordecai is saying to Esther, and effectively to us, you haven't come to this city to use this city. You've come to this city to use your royal position for such a time as this. You've come here because God has positioned you here. And maybe you just think, yeah, well, Stephen, I'm kind of here by the skin of my teeth. You know, I, I kind of, I feel, I feel like I'd be thrown out at any minute. Or maybe you feel like, well, I am here, but my position has been compromised. Uh, I haven't spoken out where I should have spoken out. I've done some shady things. You know, I've got to the place that I am, but pff, I'm not sure my conscience is perfectly clear. You're very much like Esther, hey? Do you think hers was? It's never too late. God says to you, realize where you are, realize the importance of where you are, realize that you are in the palace, and I want to start using you if you're willing to hear that call. But there is a danger to where God has positioned you. Let's look at verse 11, because we then see Esther's response to Mordecai. She says this, all the king's servants and all the people of the, king's in, of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except for the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he might live. But as for me, I've not been called to come to the king for 30 days. She's saying, Mordecai, first of all, it's a capital 
punishable offence for me to go and speak to the king without being called. Which if you double click on it, she's saying, remember, bud, I only got here because the last queen was removed because she was too bold. You are asking me to throw away everything. How, how, how can you do that? Secondly, the king hasn't called me for 30 days and the king doesn't sleep alone at night. You know what I'm saying? If he hasn't called me, the queen, to be with him for 30 days, there's a strong possibility that I am currently out of favour and if I go in unsummoned and uncalled for, I'm not going to get the scepter. I am toast. I could lose everything. Mordecai responds to her in verse 13 and 14. Do not think to yourself that the king's palace will es- that in the king's palace you will escape any more than the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you've not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai's response is, is, of course I understand what I'm asking, but if you take the risk, if you risk losing the palace, you might lose everything. But if you don't risk losing the palace, you will lose everything. You will eventually be sniffed out. They will discover that you are a Jew. You will be killed. I mean, Mordecai's going hard here. I mean, it's it's almost brutal. But then he kind of softens it at the end and he says, but who knows? Maybe you're in the palace for such a time as this. So what is he saying? Well, firstly, he's saying, unless you use the clout you have, the credentials, the money that you've got, uh, not as something to feather your own nest, to look after yourself or to care for your own aims, but you use it as a means of service for people outside of the palace, unless you do that, you know what? The palace has become a prison. If you're not willing to, if you're not willing to risk it, you know, effectively it owns you and it's destroyed you already. If you live in the palace and root your identity in your position in the palace, if you get your security in the fact that you've got money, that you've got position, that you've got finances, that you can go places and do things and buy things, that's who you are. If your net worth is your self-worth, then what has happened? It has eaten you. There is no you left if you lose your wealth. It's taken you over. Your money, your identity, your position, your career, if that's how you get your identity, if that's how you know things are okay when these things are going well, to live in the palace is effectively to get your identity from your performance. You see, that's why ethical compromise so often goes on. You know, I, you know, I, I know that's a gray area, and. and I know I should have spoken up about this. I know this is going on, but I don't want to say anything because I don't want to compromise my own position. I don't want to compromise my own career. I don't want to compromise the opinions that my boss will have. So I say nothing. You know, it it can be true too when it comes to giving. You know, I'll give a little bit here, I'll give a little bit there. But as for, you know, giving radically, giving away 10% or more, really helping people outside of the palace... I'm not so sure about that because it puts at risk my own place. Mordecai is saying, if you are unwilling to risk your place in the palace for those outside, then it's taken you over. You've become the tail and it is the dog and it's wagging you. Tim Keller uh, gives an illustration uh, uh, of a lady who came to visit his church. This lady would describe herself as an agnostic. Uh, she, she really had noth- wanted nothing to do with faith or, 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 or following the claims of Christ, but, but she visited church, and after the service, she spoke to, to Tim Keller. And she explained something that had happened at work, and she said, I made a huge mistake at my work. It was a huge error, and it cost the company significant. Now, really, I, I, I needed to be disciplined for that, and, and it was so serious and so significant 
that I stood a, uh, there was a good chance that I might lose my job. My boss went in to see the management ahead of me. And my boss took 100% of the blame. He went in there and he said, this was my team, this happened on my watch, I am responsible, please do not blame this lady. And afterwards she spoke to her boss and she said, listen, in all my years of working in business, I've had many managers who have, who, I've never had a manager who has taken the blame for my mistake. I've had many managers who've gone in and taken credit when we've done well or taken credit when the team has performed and used it to further their own careers. But never have I, have I, had, a man, have I had a boss, have I had a supervisor who has gone in and taken the blame for my mistake. Why did you do it? And he said, oh, please, please don't worry about it. You know, it, 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 it's, it's part of leadership. Um, you know, they've said, I haven't, we haven't lost our jobs. We just need to put, learn from it, put it behind us and move on. And she said, no, 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 that's not good enough an answer to me. I want to know, why did you take the blame? And he said, look, I'll, I'll, I'll say this just once, but I'm a Christian. And, and Jesus took the blame for me. And that is why... I have the desire and the ability sometimes to take the blame for others. You see, this guy had an identity that made it possible for him to own his responsibilities and to take the blame when his team failed because his identity wasn't rooted in the palace. It hadn't devoured him. He could use the palace, it was a tool, but it wasn't him. His identity was rooted in something entirely different. And he could say, you know, I will, take the, I will take the full blame for this woman's actions. And if I perish, I perish. Can you do that? Have you got that? Mordecai is therefore saying, if you can't throw away the palace, if you can't at least risk your place in the palace to do good for other people, then it owns you. So how do we get that identity? How do we get an identity that isn't rooted in the palace? Well, it comes down to the second point that Mordecai makes. Verse 14. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Now, the word there, come, you've come to your royal position. The word there, come, is actually a passive word that in other translations is, is translated brought. Who knows if you were not brought to the royal palace for such a time as this? What he's saying here is, you didn't get here except by grace. Your beauty wasn't something you earned it was given to you by God. Your position isn't something you earned. It was a door of opportunity opened to you by God. Mordecai is saying to Esther and, and, and to us this morning, the position that we are in is strictly a matter of grace. And within us, we might want to whelm up and say, yeah, yeah, that, that's all very well. But hang on a minute. You have no idea how hard I worked to get into that varsity, uh, how hard I worked to gain that promotion to buy that house. Yes, true. But you worked with talents that were given to you by God. You applied for positions that you didn't earn. They were opened to you by God. Everything we have comes to us as a matter of grace. And Esther suddenly understood it, and she began to respond to it. This Esther, who was compliant and submissive, who never rocked the boat, who, who, who never ruffled feathers, feathers, who's entirely compliant, now starts giving orders. She starts to send instructions to Mordecai. You do this, you do this, I'll do that, I'll do that. And then she declares, if I perish, I perish. This was Esther, who, who two verses earlier has said, how can you ask this of me? The king hasn't called me for 30 days. If I go in there uncalled, I'm going to die. Now says, you know what? I get it. I get God's grace. 
So if I perish, I perish. That's the effect that grace has upon you when you understand it. And it's important that we understand it. Because otherwise, the story of Esther is great. It's inspirational. It's important. But, and we decide, oh this, oh, this story of Esther is so inspiring. You know what? Uh, tomorrow, when I get to work, you know, I'm going to be different. I'm going to be telling people about Jesus. I'm going to be pointing out things which are a bit shady. I'm, I'm going to be standing up. I'm going to be fighting injustice. You know, one or two things will happen. <laughs> Either it won't last, or actually you'll become a huge pain in the backside. Because this isn't necessarily about things that we should do. It's about who we should be. And we should be like Jesus. The take home from here is not to go out and change behavior. It's to dive in to our relationship with Jesus. To be like him. To be filled with his spirit. Because Jesus left the palace of heaven. He died a death for the benefit and flourishing of those outside of the city. Ephesians 2 says this, God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even though we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive in Christ because it's by grace that you have been saved. And that's the important message of Esther. It's to understand the grace by which we are saved. Paul goes on in verse 8, for by grace you've been saved through faith. This isn't your own doing. It's a gift of God. It's not a result of your work so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do works, which God has prepared for us beforehand that we should walk in them. Do we see the order there? It's by grace that we have been saved. It's not about how hard we work, because if it's about how hard we work, we become boastful. It's about by grace we've been saved. But because we've been saved by grace, God has things for us to do. He has good works which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The story of Esther teaches us, firstly, that God has called us, God has positioned us. But God has positioned us so that as we understand that everything we have comes to us by his grace, then those positions don't own us. Those positions allow us to use our position for the flourishing of others. Faith in uncertainty. That allows us to take risks. That allows us uh, to, to serve God, to fight injustice, to stand up against racism, to stand up against gender-based violence, to stand up and fight for the poor within our communities. Why? Because our identity is not rooted in what we do. Our identity is not rooted in our position in society. Our identity is rooted in Jesus. And we follow his example. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that we have a certainty that we are yours, that you have called us by name. You left heaven and went to the cross in order that we might have a relationship with you. And our identity is now not rooted in the palace. Our identity is rooted in you. And that allows us to take risks. That allows us to stand and to fight for you and for those who don't yet know you. Thank you, Lord. Give us faith in uncertain times for your glory. Amen. I see the King of glory
Thank you guys for joining us. We've come to the end of our service. If you are joining us for the first time, please get in touch. Our contact details are on the screen. If you'd like to discuss the preach or unpack the preach, those happen in our life groups. If you aren't part of one, please get in touch with us and we can put you in one. Guys, thank you so much and we look forward to seeing you again next week.